getting ready for cottage cheese I like to start with the large curd because that way after freeze drying and then rehydrating it seems like it ends up as kind of a small or medium curd so starting with the large and we'll put half a pound in each side going to use some non stick cooking spray just a little bit on the pan and divider and then I'll wipe it all down leave just the thinnest little film I can but help make it so that it doesn't stick and the cottage cheese will pop out better some things really stick to the pans and some things don't it seems like eggs are about the worst and dairy milk milk uh, seems to be stick pretty well and then things like ground beef don't seem to stick at all and I think part of it's the texture the fact that ground beef is kind of a granular texture and so it's only touching in little spots to begin with whereas milk or eggs are liquid and poured in there and touch every little spot and won't let go so we'll get eight ounces on each side and we'll stir it up just a touch just to make sure that it's evenly mixed and then eight ounces on each side then once I get it in there then I'll kind of level it out okay eight ounces on that side and really really close now Just going to shake it back and forth a bit. And kind of like liquefaction. So then that can go in the freezer for pre-freezing. And continue with the rest of the pans. So that's it for the cottage cheese right now. One of the future batches I'm doing is cottage cheese. In preparation for that, I've put them in the freezer in the pans in half pound uh, blocks, on, half pound on each side of the divider. Now I'll pop them out, get them into the big Ziplocs or the big zipper bags and get them in the freezer until it's their turn. So I'll just kind of push the sides out a little bit, pop them up, and I better get paper towel ready to wipe hands if I needed to. I'm going to put this underneath to help keep it from warming up from the tray because I do not want it warming up. So I want to handle it as just as little as possible. Get all those popped out real quick. Okay, so each one of those blocks is a half pound of cottage cheese, so eight ounces. I'll get those back in the freezer until it's their turn. It's defrosted now. It's time to get it started for the next batch. I'm going to do a slight amount of cleaning with the little grabby tool and a paper towel to make sure that there's no bits in there and that all the little water puddles are taken care of if there's anything in there. So we'll take care of that and then get it pre-cooling. Pre so get the fan out and the little defrost baffle. Okay. So we've got paper towel and the little grabber goodie and I'm just going to start at the top and just slide it along there make sure that there's no water left in there I mean I expect maybe a little droplets yep just a little bit and then I'll use it to kind of wipe out anything that's on a shelf I don't see anything but I'll go down each one just in case there's something on there yeah, I'm not seeing anything anywhere. 
Okay, and underneath. Okay, now there's a fair amount of water in that area, but I don't see anything else on it. Well, I'll grab another one. And sometimes where the power cord is in the back, it'll collect a little bit of water that doesn't make it down right away. Okay, that's almost dry that time. All right, and the thermometer. Ah. Got to grab the thermometer. Okay. I'll put the okay. I'll put that underneath. All right. So everything's all clean. So everything's clean, dry. Got the thermometer underneath, so I can see what the temperature is happening along the barrel. And I'll get the little plastic shield in place. Get it locked down, and we'll get it pre-cooling. Get it started. And again, I always use the customized cycle. You could use the standard cycles. And I'll get the drain valve closed. And this won't be chilling for very long before we put the food in, but I still want to make sure I have a good seal ring around it. And right now it's missing here and here. So I'm going to use my little palette knife and just give it just a teeny little twist. Now I've got the ring here. Okay. Now it's all the way around. So I don't have to worry about air getting in there now or coming out. Okay. And let's see. And also, uh, there's the water from the previous batch, which was the apricots. A little bit more than a full gallon because it's way up to the top. Currently it says it's 61 degrees because it's cool down here. And as soon as it's cooled down to probably only wait until it's about 20 or 30 degrees and it'll start getting the food on the trays. This next one is dairy and we're doing cottage cheese. So we'll move over and get ready to put those on the trays. It's been about three quarters of an hour. Uh, the freeze dryer is down to below 15 degrees now time to get the cottage cheese on the trays and get them in there. Uh, this should be very quick because they were depanned some time ago so they're just in the zipper bags now. So it should be pretty quick. We'll just weigh them and get them in there. Okay, tray one. I've got the cottage cheese that I froze in the half blocks. Now it's ready to go into the trays. I did them all in half blocks. That way they're each uh, half a pound. So in case I want to rehydrate just a half a pound at a time, I can. Okay, 1891 now. Oh, well, maybe 90, it's kind of bouncing. I'll go with 90. Okay, 1876, tray three. With those all in the tray, we can get the thermometers in and get them in the freeze dryer. So I drilled the holes into the cottage cheese. Now get the thermometers in. And I do have one of my new thermometers. I ordered a set of four of them and only one's arrived so far. These are the ones that go to negative 40. I've been using ones that go from zero to 220 because in the food, the important part is really, for most foods, is when it's dry, it's, it's warm, 120-ish. But I'd like to have ones that will tell me when the food is super cold. Uh, things like orange juice and ice cream, it helps if they're super cold before you start the freeze drying cycle. So anyway, so I got these new ones and one of them arrived and three are on the way. Okay, so now we'll get those over to the freeze dryer and get them in. The freeze dryer has been pre-cooling for almost one hour and it's down to one degree. So it's plenty cold to get them in there. It's colder than the freezer was now. 
So we'll get that started. So starting at the bottom with tray four. So each tray is two and a half pounds of cottage cheese. And tray two. And tray one. And get the front piece in and you can check the temperatures. So the top one says 10 degrees, next one 10 degrees, about 14 degrees, and about 6 degrees. So depending on which one it is, it's pretty darn cold. And the one underneath says it's about negative 35 and that's the one that's touching the actual chamber all right now I want to make sure it's sealed all the way around and it looks like the rings all the way around already all right the seal has a ring all the way around it uh, so it's good and sealed I know I don't have to worry about air leaking in I'll start the vacuum pump uh, oil cleaner uh, timer and get the fan turned on to the vacuum uh, pump motor keep it nice and cool I just remembered um, somebody asked about power uh, right now with just this cooling unit going it's about 293 watts so that's the power usage with the cooling unit on in the freeze dryer I won't be able to do this right now. I'm going to have to wait until later. Okay, yeah, I'll have to wait until when I take them out to check them to get power readings. I'll write myself a note to check power under various load conditions. Uh, the highest power usage I've seen is when the vacuum pump is running and the heaters turn on. So we'll come back for that. I'll write myself a note. Uh, the cottage cheese has been in there for almost 39 hours. It's in the last few minutes. I'm going to take it out, uh, weigh it, and then put it back in for the dry check. Uh, I have added a couple of hours to it to make sure that I would be here when it finished and letting, instead of letting it stop and then have to rewarm it. So that seemed to have worked out well. All right. So it was already in the last 15 minutes, so that means the trays were already starting to cool. When it's in the last 15 minutes, the heaters turn off, so the trays have already started to cool, but they're still pretty warm. So we'll get them out and check them. So open the drain valve. And I'm going to rotate the trays top to bottom when I put them back in. So tray one. So 985, 984. And tray four. 990. And I'm putting tray one down at the bottom. Tray four up at the top. And again, I have no scientific proof that that's useful or valuable. I'm just used to doing that. So tray two, 970. And tray three, 984. Okay, and then this one will go up, and this one will come down. So now they're back in there, one through four from bottom to top. Okay, so we'll get that closed, get the drain valve closed. Sometimes there's questions about power usage. Ours is a medium machine from 2017, so yours may vary a lot. I'm going to show the power meter as I restart it. So I'll narrate what I'm doing here, but record the power meter. So right now, I can't show the actual cooler compressor starting up because it's already running. 
it, when you first start it, of course, it peaks at a higher uh, wattage and then lowers down a little bit to the level it's at now. But it will show when the vacuum pump starts and how it starts out high and then lowers down as the pressure is lowered in the chamber because then, of course, the pump has to work less. Um, and then the heaters might turn on immediately also. So I'll watch for that. If they're on, that will be with the vacuum pump just starting and the heaters on and the cooling on it, unit on. That's basically the highest level of wattage it draws. So I'll get it over the power meter before I change this and start this. So that's the power usage with just the cooling unit of the freeze dryer running. So uh, 308 watts basically. So now I'm going to put uh, more dry time. Check the drain valve. It is closed and continue. Okay, starting the pump. Okay, and the heaters are on also right now. Okay, so it bounced up, I'll have to watch the video, it bounced up over 1500 watts. So now it'll start pulling the vacuum and that will take um, about three and a quarter to three and three quarters minutes to get it below 2500 and then a few minutes to get it below 500. So we'll watch the power usage as it goes. So right now it would be the cooling unit, the heaters, and the vacuum pump. And it's kind of nice because the display basically updates once a second. Okay, the heater's turned off right there. Three minutes. Okay, and the pressure's starting to drop at three minutes, ten, or eight seconds. So now it's below 2,500. So now it's just the cooling unit of the freeze dryer, so the main freeze dryer unit and the compress, or the uh, vacuum pump. Okay, coming up on five minutes, five minutes now, and five, 870 for the pressure. And the heaters are back on. Okay, eight minutes now. Pressure is 474. So somewhere around this power level, 12, thir uh, close to 1300 watts, is the normal uh, highs for when it's running in a normal situation. Because when you first start it, it's just the vacuum portion of it, but no heaters until it gets low. So the vacuum is already running. When you rewarm it, then on this, this model, it turns the heaters on right away. So then you get that spike of higher wattage, but it still isn't even up to the level of a hair dryer. Uh, lots of those are 1800 watts. Uh, so yeah, this particular machine, the medium five-year-old machine, doesn't draw as much as a hair dryer with the vacuum pump, the vacuum chamber, the cooling unit, everything. So that's what we've got so far. That's the power usage as it's restarting. When it originally starts, it never actually gets that high because the chamber's already running then the vacuum starts and it doesn't turn the heaters on until the pressure is low. Uh, when I'm rewarming, the heaters come on early on, you know, as soon as I restart, so it spikes at a higher level. But it's still not that high. Uh, still only in the 15, 1600 watt range. Still not the level of a hair dryer. But who needs a hair dryer? So we'll be back in a couple hours and recheck it. Two hours later. Now we'll take the cottage cheese out, check it to see if it lost any weight. If it did not lose weight, then it was dry two hours ago. If it lost weight, we'll put it back in for a couple more hours and check it again. 
so 15 left to bypass the rest of it. We'll open the drain valve. Okay. Okay, tray one. And it was 984. Now it's still 984. That's a good sign. So let's check tray two. That was 970. And it's still 970. Tray three. It was 984. Now it says 984. Okay. I'm going to set this here. Whoops. And tray four. Oh, let me get that scale on the table. Okay, so looks like it's bouncing, so it's a fraction of one gram. That's good. Okay, good enough. Going to press no defrost. The weights are good. I'll get the defrost fan in place and the defrost baffle, get it defrosting, then get things moved over and get them ready to bag. Also, while we're over here, we'll check the power usage. So power usage was 27.14 kilowatt hours. So I'll reset that, get ready for the next batch. All right, tray one. So we'll get all the trays weighed and the thermometers out and find out what the current weight is. The main reason to weigh them right now is so I can get the numbers as to the weight loss. I already know that each one of these components is a half pound and my plan is to bag them with two of these in a bag so I have one pound or about a pint uh, per bag. So the main reason for the weight is just so we'll know. Tray two, tray three, and tray four. So get the math done, find out what the weights are. And again, I know that every two of these is a pound, so I'm not really worried about it as far as bagging. Uh, it's mostly just for the math. So we'll be right back, don't go away. Cottage cheese is dried and weighed now. It was 10 pounds, now it's just a little over two pounds. It's 892 grams. So each pound would be about 89.2 grams. Um, I did weigh them out in blocks of half pound when I first did these. I'm going to just take two blocks, put them in a bag, and call that the one pound, and put the amount of water that's needed, which is about 364 grams of water. As I put them in the bags, I'm going to try to crumble them just as little as possible so all the curd stays as big as possible. With cottage cheese, as you freeze dry it and rehydrate it, it always seems to break down the size. Though perhaps if you left it as that block and bagged it without touching it, maybe it would come back the same. But you'd have to use a much bigger bag to put it in there without crumbling it up a little bit. So that's what I do, is I just try to do it very gentle. So we'll get them bagged and then move over to the storage bins and get them stored. So the bags are labeled now. I've got what batch number it is for me, so 528 and 28 of this series. Cottage cheese, the date that it went into the freeze dryer, so June 16th. It was one pound and that it needs 364 grams of water to bring it back to similar to what it was. And I found with cottage cheese that if you put that water in it and in a small container with it and then let it set for a few hours in the refrigerator, it really does nice. I need to put two of these blocks into each bag for the pound. I'm going to use one of the uh, flexible cutting mats and move these blocks over there. Okay. I've got those two blocks. I'm going to again do just a little bit 
I mean, it's very, very fragile, so it's not like it takes much. You can barely touch it. All right. Okay, so that's within uh, about two and a half grams of the ideal weight for the total. So that's not bad. And there's the one pound. And that will close without crushing things. So that's the way I'm bagging them. All right. So now I've got it separated again. And the scale really doesn't matter at this point because I know uh, that I have them, how I have them blocked up already. So I really don't need to weigh them except to confirm if anything is really out of, out of order on it. Yeah, I really don't need to weigh them because I, I know how the blocks are, so I'll get rid of that. They're all in there. One of the viewers mentioned, because I'm a sloppy writer and sometimes I get things wrong, that if I use uh, the wipes, it takes off the um, it takes off the felt pen marks, and it seems to do a great job. It doesn't seem to damage the bag in any way. So, yeah, I've had to use that, and it seems to work really well. The cottage cheese is in ten one quart bags. These are the seven mil mylar bags that are have the gusseted bottoms. I'm going to put uh, 300 cc oxygen absorbers in them, get them sealed up, and then get them in the bins. So I'm going to slide the oxygen absorber kind of down the side a bit, keep it out of the seal area. I'm going to, I'm not going to try to pull out or push out any extra air for two reasons. One, it's almost at the top. There's really no space. And two, I don't want to crush the cottage cheese any more than necessary. Uh, as the oxygen absorbers do their magic, it's going to shrink this bag anyway. So it's going to crush it some. So I don't want to help that out. Okay, going to get the bag sealed now. I'm using an impulse sealer made by Impact. I, I know that the newer uh, Harvest Right comes with a different sealer. This is what they had at the time and I was really happy to get this because this is what I was used to seeing commercially um, at a place I used to work. So I'm doing it twice. I have it s turned down slightly to around a 6 out of 8 which is slight, ever so slightly cool uh, on the first bag. But on subsequent bags, that's plenty hot. So on the first one, I just do it twice to make sure that it's sealed well. Way at the top of the seal. Got room for a couple more in case that one fails or it has a wrinkle in it. You know, move that out of the way for a second. So I make sure that it's got a nice smooth area at the top. So there are no wrinkles in it. And then once it finishes, there it is. I, let, I like to let it set for just a couple of seconds to cool just a little bit. And that's it. I mentioned before that we seal most of our stuff in quart bags now. We have pint bags, quart bags, and probably gallon bags. When we first started, we used the biggest bags we could to get the fewest number of bags for a batch. 
But when we started using the freeze-dried items, we found that we really liked the ones that had smaller amounts in the bag. So we didn't have as much leftover to deal with afterwards. So we've gradually gone down to smaller and smaller bags and depending on which product it is. Like I said, I know I mentioned before about the bag sizes. Um, this is the one quart bag and it's the gusseted bottom one and it actually holds slightly less than a quart. This is the pint bag and again gusseted bottom. It's, it holds slightly more than a pint. Then the two quart I think holds a little bit more than a, a two quarts and it's a gusseted bottom also. And then this giant bag, this is what we used to use the most of, it was these two. And then we've slowly moved down the scale. Now most of what we bag goes in this size with a little bit on either side of it. So for some of the items that I know I'm going to want for a lunch snack or something, I really like the pint bag. And same with some of the sweets or desserty type items, I like the pint bag. Uh, but mainly it's great for a lunch type of thing or maybe spices or things that are going to be added to other things later. But yeah, so quart bag is what we use the most of now. And about the only thing I use this for now, the giant one, is when we buy a giant bag of corn chips at Costco, then we rebag them into these so that they don't go stale uh, before we finish a bag. Let's move over and get them in the bins. Okay, one last probably unnecessary thing that I like to do is I'm going to add the gross weight to each bag so that if they ever fail and start allowing moisture to go in, I'll know without having to open them. So it's 117 grams and it's bouncing to 118, so I'm going to write down 118 on it. So now in the bottom corner I've got 118 grams so I know that if it ever gets heavier I know that moisture is coming into that bag. Okay as soon as I get the weights on all those then we'll move over and put them in the bin. The cottage cheese is bagged and ready to go into the bin. It's going in bin 5 with the last few things and bin 5 isn't very full yet. Um, all of the bags that we've put in bin 5 so far have been relatively small. So we might end up with extra room there, but that could come in handy with the last uh, batches and we can move things around or add things to any bin that's low and not add an, yet another bin. Okay, so let's get those in the bin. Alright, so we've got the bins with the apricots from last time. We'll be adding the cottage cheese on top of this. And you can see the oxygen absorbers have done their magic and so anyway so and if you were not careful you could crush the stuffings out of these because they're just hard and crunchy all right so let's, now we'll add the cottage cheese to the bin and just kind of trying to nestle them in there so that the whole bin stays kind of level now our mixed bin has the dairy product in it. Uh, next we're going on to starch and going back to a potato one again. And this one's going to be mashed potatoes, homemade mashed potatoes. And if your homemade mashed potatoes don't have little lumps in them, then you might as well just use store-bought powdered stuff. I like my mashed potatoes with texture. All right, so that one's done. Moving on. This video series has been the best thing that's to happen to our freeze drying. It's made us come up with a schedule, a plan, uh, what we want to do and when and why, and collect a lot of data that I never bothered with before. I want to thank you for watching and for following along. It's been great. Uh, we're more than halfway through and we'll keep on going and see where it goes. Thanks a lot and thanks for subscribing. Thanks for supporting and on to the next batch. And once again, I forgot to start the recording, so I don't have the video. I'd like to have ones that could tell me when the cold soup, when the cold superfood, no, when the food is super cold.